Hello and welcome to the channel where we discuss medical topics and lifestyle. In this video today, we are talking about rectal bleeding in adults. So rectal bleeding is a common reason for patients to consult their GPs, go to their urgent care centers or emergency departments. And there's a lot of different causes like uh, piles, diverticular disease, things like that. So we're going to cover it all in this video. So let's get into it occult bleeding to a life-threatening kind of bleed or hemorrhage um, in clinically stable patients. We have to assess it. We have to make sure there isn't anything else going on. If somebody's unstable, then we have to take another approach, right? So it's not that easy. So let's say we have a 70-year-old patient who comes in to see their doctor. What are we actually going to do? So there's a few question marks in our minds, and uh, we, have to, we have to go through everything accordingly. Now, before we even get started, we have to identify if this person is stable or not. If they're not stable, then this is an entirely different ballgame. We have to go to the hospital, right? This isn't something you can do at your friend's house or your GP or your family medicine practitioner. You have to go to the hospital to get it checked out. Now, we need to think about the causes of rectal bleeding. What exactly is going on? What's actually causing this? And the way we're going to do this is by taking a history and so on. We need to think about the investigations that we're going to do. So how are we going to find out what the cause of the rectal bleeding is if we don't have enough information from just the history and the examination? So these are the things that we have to keep in mind. And then the most important thing out of everything is we need to identify the red flags. So rectal bleeding, a big cause is cancer. So that's the most worrisome thing. And um, this is what we need to identify immediately, urgently, and refer urgently. So we have a video on this, how to identify this very promptly, very accurately, and um, how, to, how to look for these red flags. So I'll link that in the description below. And now let's move on to the other causes of rectal bleeding that can occur. So in the first place, we have diverticular bleeding. So that's a very common cause of bleeding. We have a whole other video on what diverticular disease is and so on, but essentially they're pouches that form in the wall of the colon. Um, it can be related to age, to fiber, you know, diet, things like that, check the video. I'll link it in the description below. But essentially, diverticular disease will present typically as painless, intermittent, and reasonably large volume blood loss. So bleeding from a diverticular is a relatively rare complication, but a common cause of rectal bleeding due to the high prevalence of diverticulosis. It's more common with increasing age, of course. The color of the blood, it can vary. So it can be from fresh red to darker, altered blood, depending on the site and the rate of the bleeding. Two-thirds of diverticular bleeds occur kind of proximally in the colon, but if the bleeding is significant, then it can be noticed also. Diverticular bleeding, usually self-limiting, but the patient may need resuscitation with fluids and, uh, and hospital management as well. So it all depends on the severity. All right, now let's talk about anal rectal disorders. What do I mean by that? So there's a few. Piles are the most common cause. So hemorrhoids, most common cause of bleeding under the age of 50. So the bleeding typically, typically comes from internal hemorrhoids, meaning they're mainly painless. It is bright red at the end of a motion, not mixed with stew, stool, poo, and may continue to drip into the bowl and be seen on wiping as well. Hemorrhoidal bleeding is rarely significant enough, enough to like, you know, make you end up in the hospital, make you unstable, but crucially, rectal bleeding attributed to hemorrhoids represents the most common missed opportunity to establish a cancer diagnosis. So that's something to keep in mind there. Then we have an anal fissure. So it is a split in the skin at the anus, which makes it exquisitely painful to pass a motion and may cause a minor superficial fresh red bleeding. May not be possible to see the fissure when you're examined, but the majority are managed medically with creams, topical treatment, increased dietary intake of fiber and water, and sometimes laxatives as well. Then we have rectal varices. So these are dilated due to backflow in the veins of the rectum, typically from things like portal hypertension. Bleeding is fresh, but the severity can vary from mild and self-limiting to massive. Treatment involves pharmacological reduction of the portal pressure, meaning tablets, to help reduce the pressure. And then finally, we have a solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. It's a bit of a bit of a weird name um, because there's usually more than one ulcer, so it's not just solitary, but it's a rare and benign disorder, and it's associated with straining, bleeding, mucus, uh, prolapse, tenesmus, so that urge that you want to empty, and uh, you know, a sense of incomplete evacuation. So next we have colitis, meaning inflammation of the colon. That's what colitis means. Typically, you think about inflammatory bowel disease, but there's a few other causes of colitis, so we'll go through them now that can cause bleeding. So we have ischemic colitis, so it refers to inflammation of the colon due to a vascular insufficiency and ischemia, so lack of blood flow. The location can obviously vary depending on the site in the colon. 
it's most commonly caused by, like I said, an ischemia or a vascular insufficiency. So things like shock uh, can precipitate it um, because you know the vessels constrict, and uh, and then it, and then it causes that to happen. The presentation is generally an abdominal pain, uh, bloody stools, left-sided abdominal tenderness. Um, it can range from you know being quite kind of okay in appearance to the person being very very unwell. Then we have infectious colitis. So this remains a differential. It's diarrhea and rectal bleeding. Viral is the most common cause, but we also have bacterial causes as well listed there. So Campylobacter, E. coli, Salmonella, and Shigella. Then we talk about inflammatory bowel disease. So that's Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Crohn's is usually spared from bleeding, but it's almost universal that the ulcerative colitis will have bleeding. So ulcerative colitis most commonly presents between the ages of 15 to 25, but there also can be a peak later on in um, in old age. And then finally, radiation proctitis. So it's a side effect of radiotherapy when you're treating things like cancer. Um, acute uh, proctitis, it occurs in about up to 75% of patients and will present during or soon or after completion of therapy. It's usually self-limiting. It will last up to six weeks, but um, and it can typically, typically present within two years of treatment but it's self-limiting, like we said. So most common presentation, rectal bleeding, difficulty evacuating, and tenesmus. So those are generally the causes of rectal bleeding. Now let's recap this. So how are we actually going to assess this? What are we going to do going forward? How do we manage this entire picture? So we have the doctor, we have the patient coming to the doctor. What are our thoughts? What are we thinking about? So the first thing we have to do is take a history, see what's actually going on. If the patient is unstable, like we mentioned earlier on, then the priority is going to be to go to hospital and sort things out there. So we have to take a history. We have to do the examination. So examination is usually usually comprises of pulse, blood pressure, checking their weight, doing an abdom abdominal examination, as well as a digital rectal exam. And then we can talk about investigating with blood tests and other things. So a baseline full blood count would be quite useful to see what's going on. And then stool tests as well are quite important there. Fecal calprotectin is very, very important in the differentiation between IBS and IBD. There's a video on that. Please check it out. I'll leave it in the description below. So we can do we can do also fecal occult blood testing. So testing for microscopic blood in the stool that gives us an indication whether it's cancer or not. So when we're assessing a patient, like I said, we have to assess the rectal bleeding, but if it's severe, if it's unstable, so if the parts of the examination are very, very unusual. The blood pressure is very low. If we're very unwell, then we have to send this person to the hospital. This is how we manage that. There's nothing for us to do in a doctor's office bed. So that's when it comes to that. Then if the patient is stable, we talk about how we're going to figure out what's going on, what are actually going to be the causes in our minds. The easiest way of splitting this up is to categorize the rectal bleeding as painless or painful. Right. So that's in our minds how we can differentiate between the two and start to really from an umbrella of issues in our minds, we can start to kind of narrow it down and see what's going on. So from the painless issues, we have hemorrhoids, we have diverticular disease, we have angiodysplasia, we have post polypectomy. So after colonoscopy, for example, solitary ulcer and also malignancy can also present as painless cancer. Then we have the painful category. So the painful category. We mentioned earlier on a few of them. So there we have, for example, um, fissures and things like that. But also we can differentiate the painful category into whether there are abdominal symptoms or whether there are anal rectal symptoms. So that's how we can split up painful as well to narrow it down even more. So when there's abdominal symptoms and painful rectal bleeding, we're thinking about colitis and malignancy. When there's anal rectal symptoms, we are thinking about hemorrhoids, fissures, proctitis, and malignancy. So as you can see, malignancy can overlap, and a few of the others can overlap, but malignancy can overlap between the two sides. So it's very, very important that that is the thing you first exclude, and then you dive a little bit deeper and see what's going on. So again, you know, I'll leave a link in the description for the other video with that because it's super, super important. We're not going to cover it here, but malignancy can overlap. Once we exclude that, then we can think about all these other things and manage it and assess it accordingly. And there you have it. That's the video on rectal bleeding. Key points. So the etiology, so the causes can be varying. They can pose a significant challenge in primary care when you're trying to diagnose it. Patients can be anxious about this. You know, it's blood in their poo and we need to, we need to see what's going on. And the main thing is to exclude cancer and then think about the rest. The location can depend on 
um, the color of the bleeding, right? So this can be misleading. If it's bright red, dark red, it can give us an indication. The presence of an anorectal disease does not necessarily exclude all other causes, right? If you have a hemorrhoid, it doesn't mean you can't have cancer as well, for example, or vice versa. Um, rectal bleeding attributed to hemorrhoids represents the most common missed opportunity to establish a cancer diagnosis. That's the very, very key point there. And keep a high index of suspicion. So that's the most important takeaway key points here. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you learned something. Like and subscribe for more. Leave a comment in the section below and we'll see you in the next one. Take care.